Hey guys, it's Danny. Welcome to another episode of our Orchid Care for Beginners series. Today we are talking all about Paphiopetalum orchids also known as slipper orchids due to this wonderful shape of the flower. These orchids are becoming more and more popular even in flower shops and garden centers, but they are quite different than most other orchids we can grow. Don't worry though, they're very easy to care for. So today I'll walk you through how they grow, what makes them so different, give you some care tips, and of course go ahead and repot one of these orchids because there are things you need to keep in mind and do just a little bit differently for them than you would for a typical Phalaenopsis. Today's episode, along with our entire Orchid Care for Beginners series, is sponsored by RepotMe.com, who offers you everything you could possibly need to properly take care of your orchid, from media to fertilizer, pots, and all sorts of accessories. Some of the accessories that I will use in this care series and in today's video are provided by RepotMe, so I will link you to their website down below in the description, feel free to visit them at any time. So with that said, let's start by getting to know them a little bit better and see why they're so different. The major difference between a Paphiopetalum orchid and a Phalaenopsis or Cattleya or a Dendrobium or an Oncidium is that Paphiopetalums are not necessarily epiphytic. Depending on the species and on the hybrid you have, most of them are actually terrestrial or lithophytes. Most of them are not known to grow on trees, but rather on the soil. This, however, doesn't mean that these orchids should be potted directly in soil because it might still be a little too heavy for them. Just because they don't grow in trees doesn't mean they don't appreciate air ventilation in their pot. They still do, just not as much as a Phalaenopsis. And just by looking at it and compare it to a normal Phalaenopsis, we will be able to see clearly the cultural differences. First off, where are the so-called aerial roots? These are the roots that grow outside of the pot and if you've ever owned a Phalaenopsis orchid, no matter if it's a standard or a miniature, you know that they are very, very willing to put out roots in the air all over the place depending on the age. Well, Paphiopetalums don't grow aerial roots because they don't grow in the air. So their roots are not adapted to withstand the very low humidity levels that we can find in the air compared to the medium. Furthermore, if a Paphiopetalum root starts to grow outside of the medium, it will stop growing even before reaching half an inch or a centimeter or so, and it will only start to regrow again if it starts to feel moisture and, of course, if it's not already dried. But not only do the roots behave different, they also look very, very different. In the case of Phalaenopsis orchids, you might know when the roots are dry, they tend to be rather silvery, and when you wet them, provided they received a little bit of light, they will green up. Well, not Paphiopetalum roots. Path roots are typically brown and fuzzy. They will not change color if they're wet, simply because they don't have any chlorophyll pigment, they don't photosynthesize, they are meant to always grow beneath the orchid, in the substrate. The roots of a Paphiopetalum orchid can be slightly misleading for beginners. Just because they're brown does not mean they're not healthy. The root tips are typically yellow as well. You will never see Paphiopetalum roots being green, or having very vivid green root tips. Even though from the point of view of the leaf structure they might look similar to Phalaenopsis orchids, Paphiopetalums are not actually monopodial orchids, meaning they don't have a central axis that produces roots, leaves, and flower spikes that will continuously grow. Actually, Paphiopetalums are more like Oncidiums and Cattleyas because they are sympodial, but instead of having canes or pseudobulbs, they produce fans. And even though they do have a sort of central stem, they will not continue to produce leaves from the top of this stem. What will happen is they will produce a flower spike. Because the flower spike is the last formation of a fan, we call it a terminal spike. Nothing else will grow from this crown, not a flower spike, not a leaf, and in time, the fan itself will slowly wither off. But this definitely does not mean that the orchid will completely die off. Soon after the fan blooms, 
another new growth starts to develop at the base, very similarly to Oncidiums or Cattleyas. These two structures are connected through a rhizome, which is very, very small and typically we don't get to see since it's in the potting mix, but this new growth will continue to grow and develop and in about two years time it will reach the size of the mother fan. At which point it will bloom as well, provided we offered good care, and soon after it will start to produce a new growth or a new fan of its own, and the cycle will continue. As I was saying, the older fans, which have already bloomed, will slowly wither off, which can look a little bit scary if you're not used to Paphiopetalums. So in my case here, can you actually see the old fan? Maybe not, but this leaf right here is not a new leaf. It's an old leaf which is withering off and feeding the new growth. And if we look just in between these new fans, we can see the remains of the older fan. This is the yellow leaf that I showed you earlier, and here in the back we have a completely withered off leaf. At this point I can actually cut away this leaf because it's really hard to pull it off, but when the leaves are still yellowing I prefer to keep them on the plant because they do divert all the energy they have into these new growths. So in time, even if your orchid will bush out because each fan can produce multiple fans in return, the oldest, oldest fans will not linger on the plant for way too long. Within about two, three years, they will wither off, so you are safe to remove all of these dried leaves. But I would suggest not removing the older growths before they actually start to yellow on their own. When the flowers wither off and the flower spike dries, you are absolutely safe to cut it as close to the fan as possible, because it will not rebloom, it will not branch out, but there are a few Paphiopetalums which do continue to bloom from the very same flower spike for a little bit more, but they don't all do this, and the best thing to do is to research the name of your Paphiopetalum and try to find out the flowering pattern that it has. Most flower shop hybrids on the market though will only create one flower on the top of each flower spike. So if you don't have a tag for your path, just presume you will only get one flower and if you get more, well, that's a bonus. You can acquire a wide variety of Paphiopetalums from specialized orchid nurseries and there are quite a few very different types of paths. One of which, and my personal favorite, is the mottled leaf Paphiopetalum. Some Paphiopetalums are known to have really, really beautiful patterns on their leaves. And this orchid looks absolutely fantastic even if it's not in bloom. And I know there are many growers who collect Paphiopetalums simply for their foliage and maybe not so much for their blooms. These orchids actually don't bloom all that often. Each fan blooms only once on a terminal spike and it can take up to two years or maybe even more for a fan to completely mature. If you have a well-established mature plant, you can have flowers about every year or year and a half or so, but there are instances in which you have to wait about two to three years for a bloom. Well, this is where the model leaf Paphiopetalum shines, because the rest of the year you can absolutely enjoy the beautiful mottling on their leaves. But there are also green-leafed Paphiopetalums on the market. The nice thing about these ones is that some of them are sequential bloomers or multifloral, which means they can produce multiple flowers on the very same flower spike. In the case of sequential bloomers, an inflorescence can even last up to a year or even more. The flowers can also be very spectacular, so even if the foliage might not impress you as much, usually the flowers with these guys are just incredible. Other than that, they look just like a typical mottled leaf Paphiopetalum. The roots look the same and they also act the same. Size-wise, these orchids can vary a little bit. You can have pretty large Paphiopetalums and typically the green-leafed ones, the multifloral, they tend to be rather larger. Or you can have pretty tiny ones, like many of the model leaves are. How long will the flowers last? Well, it really depends on variety or species and also on your environment. If your environment is a little bit more humid and more in the intermediate temperatures, flowers can actually last quite a long time. And in this example, I have this orchid in bloom from January or February and now it's May. And this is because 
Well, in the winter and spring, I do have quite a lot of humidity in my growing space and also temperatures are not all that high. But you can see that the flowers are already looking pretty bad. So I can go ahead and cut them and let these growths actually feed the new growths that I see already started. But of course, some Buffyopetalums will last a month or two. Typically, one to three months is a typical bloom duration for Paphiopetalums, with the exception, of course, of the sequential bloomers, which will continue to put on flower after flower, so the whole flowering show can actually last quite a lot of time. So now that we know Paphiopetalum orchids a little bit better, let's go through their cultural needs, which actually is the easy part, because these orchids are very, very suited for home conditions, they are well suited for beginners as well, but of course we need to know a few things that they prefer. So let's start with light. These orchids are not highlight orchids, they prefer more shady situations. If you have good enough light for Phalaenopsis orchids, these guys will do great as well. Bright shade, intermediate light, very filtered sun is what these orchids will prefer. Of course, they will not mind a little bit of very early morning sun, but for the main part, do try to shelter them from direct sunshine or else their leaves can burn. In the case of the green leaf Paphiopetalum, the more light you provide, the paler the leaves can be. An intense light actually doesn't really help them bloom. I personally grow my Paphiopetalum collection under artificial light with just a typical kitchen LED tube and they're looking great, they bloom well, I don't need to provide sunshine or natural light and this makes them really really great even for offices or places in your home which don't receive natural light. Temperature-wise, generally speaking, they are intermediate to warm growers depending on variety and species, but you will be absolutely safe keeping them in intermediate and slightly warm conditions. Try to shelter them from extreme cold and extreme heat, and again, typically, if you can do great with a Phalaenopsis from the temperature point of view, you will do great with these guys as well. The Paphiopetalums don't need a cool down in winter to bloom, and also they are continuous growers, they don't take dormancies, and even though a little bit of variation between daytime and nighttime temperatures is welcome for some species or varieties, typically the very easy to care for hybrids on the market don't really require much hassling. Humidity wise, again, I don't find these orchids to be particularly fussy. Higher humidity helps any orchid because it limits water loss through transpiration, but what's important is to make sure that they receive proper watering, which in my opinion is one of the key cultural things you should keep in mind with Paphiopetalums. Remember I told you at the beginning that roots simply don't grow in the air? They will simply not grow if the medium gets very, very dry either. So do try to maintain the medium rather damp than dry. The way you can water Paphiopetalums is exactly like Phalaenopsis. You can either run water through the pot or just soak the pot for 10 minutes, put it back in its place and call it a day. How frequently you need to water? Well, depends on your environment. The key is to not let them be dry for way too long. So if you need to water them every two days, do that. If you need to water them every week, water them every week. There is no set time. It will depend on the environment and the orchid. Like any orchid, they do enjoy fertilizer and I do give them whatever I give to my other orchids, but since they are slow growers generally, they don't tend to be heavy feeders. So with Paphiopetalums, if I skip fertilizer, it's not a big deal. I sometimes skip it intentionally, but I do try at least once every two to three weeks to offer them fertilizer. One thing that is really important with most Paphiopetalums is calcium. But these guys don't only use rainwater without any type of fertilizer. You can actually go for tap water even if it's a bit harder, because most of these paths will actually enjoy it. As a matter of fact, with my Paphiopetalums, I mainly use tap water, not reverse osmosis water. Whenever I fertilize, I do use reverse osmosis water because my fertilizer is the MSU, which is especially created for that water, but other than that, I just use tap water and my Paphiopetalums seem to really enjoy it, the color of the leaf is really nice, roots grow well, and I don't see any calcium or magnesium deficiency. Repotting Paphiopetalum orchids is a little bit different as well, since they are not epiphytes, but they can actually be potted in your typical transparent Phalaenopsis pot or general orchid pot, 
the medium can be made out of bark or other materials since they do enjoy aeration, but you can also incorporate a little bit of sphagnum moss there if your environment tends to be very dry or very warm most of the time. So now let's go ahead and repot a Paphiopetalum. So here I have a little Paphiopetalum orchid which I acquired from a flower shop not long ago and as we can see it's in serious need of repotting. First of all, it is potted way, way, way too high above the medium. And can we see that the little roots which tried to grow here simply stopped growing? Well, that's because the roots do not grow in the air. They enjoy a lot more moisture than this. So we need to address the level of the medium. And also this medium looks kind of bad. It is kind of broken down. You can see it crumbles very fast and it also smells pretty bad when I water it. So first of all, I will remove the flower spike, which you can see is completely dry. And the way to cut the flower spike is by going very close to the crown. Make sure you don't actually cut the leaves and just give it a snip and that's it. Next, let's see how the root system is doing and we will need a tray to catch the medium. And just like with any other repotting, I will squeeze a little bit on the pot just to make sure that any root which is attached to the side of the pot simply detaches really fast. I will grab the orchid as close to the base of the stem as possible and pull up. And sadly, my little orchid really doesn't have a very good root system. Being that Paphiopetalum orchids have pretty brown roots, it can be a little bit hard to determine which root is alive. So rather than checking for color changes and things of the sorts, which with Paphiopetalums does not happen, what we can do is press gently on the roots. And if the roots feel papery or mushy, and if you pull a little on them, they just come off, then those roots are not alive anymore. Unlike Phalaenopsis, Paphiopetalum orchids will not necessarily leave a string behind. What will happen is the entirety of the root will just detach. But checking the other roots on this Paphiopetalum, I don't think they are dead. So I will leave them be and I'll just give you a close up. We can see on this particular root where the fuzz came off that it is actually alive. So I'll make sure to be very gentle because Paphiopetalum roots tend to be rather sensitive they can snap really, really fast. So I will dispose of all of this medium, I will not reuse anything, and I will come back with a brand new pot and fresh medium. Before I repot the orchid though, I will spray the roots with hydrogen peroxide 3% because I am pretty sure I did have some bush snails in that medium. And hydrogen peroxide will help me get rid of them. I do have quite a few repotting tricks such as this one and I compiled them in a video. I will link it to you down below if you missed it, do check it out. So before anything, I will just make sure that the root system of my orchid is properly sprayed no need to spray the entirety of the orchid. Now, when choosing a pot for a slipper orchid, size is not necessarily as important as it would be for an epiphytic orchid because these orchids really like to stay rather moist than dry. So I have here two slotted pots from RepotMe which have drainage and ventilation. One is a three inch, the other one is a four inch. So let's see which one of these fits my orchid better. So if I were to use the three inch pot, we can see that the root system does fit but the problem is the orchid would be a little bit too high inside the pot. I would rather not try to push the orchid down because these roots are really not all that flexible. And I also know that with proper care, this orchid will actually take over the pot fairly fast within the year. And I don't really want to repot it in a year, but rather in two. So I think a much better choice for my orchid will be the four inch pot, which we can see does allow quite a bit of space here for my roots to grow and my orchid will be at the proper level in the pot. So I do believe I will go for this pot. The potting mix that I will be using consists of bark chips and sphagnum moss. I personally like to mix my potting mixes myself because I do live in a pretty difficult and hot climate. 
In this mixture, make sure that the roots do have some aeration, but they're not prone to drying out way too fast. They will be rather moist, which is what I want for my orchid. So you can definitely make your own mixture, but if you are not sure what type of medium you should use, you can go for a pre-made mix, and I do have a review of the slipper orchid mix from Repotme. I will link it to you down below. I think it's a great mixture, but I would love it even more if it had just a little bit of sphagnum moss. We're in a subtropical climate here and things tend to dry out very fast for most of the year. So with this mixture, I will start with a layer of sphagnum moss at the bottom because when I water, the moss will make sure that it will absorb whatever excess water I have in the dish. If I would put bark at the bottom, this would not happen and water would just pool in the dish, which I don't really want. So with this layer, I will arrange my orchid in the pot and then continue adding the mixture. And here we are, the orchid is repotted. At the top of the pot, I like to only place bark chips, no sphagnum moss. And this is a pretty thin layer because bark chips does not attract algae. Being that this pot will stay rather moist, algae will form on the top of the sphagnum moss and keeping it shaded will completely prevent algae formation. But as you can see inside the medium, I do have quite an even mixture of sphagnum moss and bark. I do use a little bit more bark than sphagnum moss. And can we see the level? I don't have any roots sticking out of the medium. This is what you want with your Paphiopetalum. And actually the idea with more bark at the top works really, really great because at the same time, you don't want to bury the stem of your Paphiopetalum into very wet medium because that can lead to rotting. So a layer of bark on top will keep things rather humid but airy at the same time. And you'll be very, very safe from rotting issues. I also like to use decorative containers with my Paphiopetalums because they do maintain everything stable. And also since the roots of slipper orchids do not photosynthesize, there really is no need whatsoever for light touching the roots. The purpose of the transparent pot is to give you an indication when you should water your orchid and also how the roots are doing if you have any issues that you should address. And pretty much it's a monitoring aid. It doesn't necessarily help the orchid. One thing though, make sure that in between the actual orchid pot and the decorative container, you do have a little bit of space because you do still wanna have a little bit of ventilation around the roots. You don't wanna suffocate them, but you don't want to let them dry out way too much either. With Paphiopetalums, it is a great idea to water after repotting because they do need that moisture to enable their roots to properly grow. And that is about it for today for Paphiopetalums. I hope this tutorial will help you out and you will give this guy a try because they really are very, very beautiful and rewarding orchids, well suited for beginners. They just need a little bit of a different care routine. So thank you guys for watching and thank you Repodme for sponsoring this video together with the entirety of our Orchid Care for Beginners series. You have links to their store and products down below in the description together with other useful Paphiopetalum related links. Subscribe to my channel for more orchid videos, tutorials, experiments, updates and other fun orchid subjects. If you wish to support the channel, do consider becoming a member or visit the merch store linked down below in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook. It's always nice to stay in touch there as well. And with that said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye!